Tonight, you may be seated. I want to be teaching on a very sensitive subject. I've titled it, The Twelfth Rewards of Eternity. What I will be sharing tonight is quite much. So I want to take time to read. And I also want you to write the scriptures down so you go and study them. So I won't be preaching tonight. I want you to get these things because they are very, very important. Sometimes when we preach, people lose out on so many sensitive points. And so I'll be deliberately reading scriptures in order to help us maintain the pace and not to emphasize one over the other. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. He said, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so everybody who comes to this side of the divide, at some point you may have to return to where you came from. You know, when you study man, there are many thresholds from whence you can take your study. You can study man as a biological species. And you can also study man as a creature of eternity. When you look at the framework of a man, like I've told you many times, man is the only creature that has three lives working in him simultaneously. All the spirits function only by spirit life. All the animals function by the life of the flesh, which is in the blood. In fact, when you study the Bible in Aramaic and in Greek, these things will be very clear to you. Because the word life has three different nomenclatures. You have the zoe, which is the life of God or the life of the spirit. You have the suke, which is the life of the soul. And you have the bios, which is the life of the flesh. Of all the creations of God, only man was designed to function in the spirit realm, in the soulish realm, and in the natural realm legally at all times. And God designed that for a definite purpose. The reason is simple. Man was the prince of Zion that was given the responsibility to be the governor of the visible realm. And so man of necessity was going to participate in the spirit, but he was going to live from the physical. Although he's representing God in the physical, he's not expected to be disconnected from the spiritual. So while his domain is the physical and the visible realm, he needed to vitally participate in the spiritual realm. And God also wanted to have continual fellowship with man. So God needed to invade this realm from time to time to be able to have experiential fellowship with man. So a gangway needed to be created. And so when God designed the realm, in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1, he said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. At first, the visible and the spiritual was created. But when man was introduced into the equation, God added another creation called Eden. Because there needed to be a bridge between the earth and the heavens. So Eden is not a place, it's a portal. So that there is connectivity between heaven and earth at all times. And that is because man needed to function in a place where he could interact with heaven and earth at the same time. But for legality to be credited to that kind of operation, he needed three kinds of life to operate. So there is the spirit life. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9. God planted the tree of life in the garden. He wanted the man to eat it so that the man can become a legal participant in the realms of God. Because he's actually a prince in Zion. In Genesis chapter 2 from verse 7. God formed the dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils. And the man became a living soul. In Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11, 
the light of the flesh is in the blood. So man was supposed to have a spirit life that powered his spirit, a soulish life that powered his soul, and an animal or a bodily life that powers his body. So he can relate with the physical legally, and he can relate both with the preternatural and the supernatural realm legally. But you see, the reality of the man does not really begin from the physical. So you can define the man from a biological plane, but if that is all you know about the man, your knowledge is grossly deficient. Because there are two other dimensions of life that is not biological. There is the soulish life and there is the spirit life that the man possesses. This is why the Bible is drawing our attention in Hebrews 9.27 that when it looks as if the biological life has come to an end, don't make the mistake of thinking man's reality has ended. He said it's appointed to men to die once. He said after that, the civilization the reality and the life continues. There will be judgment. Because now he's going to be admitted fully to begin to function from the spiritual realm as his original domicile. But for him to operate there, he will first of all be exiled. And so there is a bridge between life and eternity. That bridge is called judgment. This is why in Revelation chapter 20 from verse 11 to verse 15, the Bible made us understand that the gate that everybody must pass through is called the white throne judgment. Because you can't cross from time into eternity without judgment. But you see, there are two kinds of judgment. There is judgment unto condemnation and there is judgment unto reward. Tonight, my focus is not judgment unto condemnation. My focus tonight is judgment unto reward. Glory to God. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 that the Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Check it for me quickly. Or is that 2 Corinthians? Get me that scripture quick. It says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For we all must appear Second Corinthians 5.10 Before the judgment seat of Christ That everyone may receive the things done in this body According to that he had done Whether it be good or bad So you discover that there is a judgment seat In Revelation 20 from verse 11 to 15 And there is also a judgment seat in Second Corinthians 5.10 In Revelation 20 Every being that has been created must be judged. And so you see two kinds of judgment there. The first kind of judgment there, the Bible said a book will be opened called the book of life. It said if your name is not found in it, it said you will be destroyed. You will be cast into the lake of fire. It said that's the second death. And then it said another book is opened, which is the book of works. Every work that we have done. So that second judgment of works is the judgment seat of Christ. So this is not where men are actually condemned. But this is where men are rewarded for the quality of life and works that they have done. The parameter for condemnation is clear. If you don't accept Jesus, the Bible said you are condemned already. Because he said this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. He said, but men have chosen darkness. He said, but whoever chooses him he said that person has passed from death to life. John chapter 5, verse 24 to verse 26. So we know that those of us who are in Christ, Christ was judged on the cross. So our condemnation was put upon him. In fact, Romans chapter 8, verse 2, he said, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you are in Christ, it says there's no condemnation for you because it will be law of double jeopardy. Christ has already been condemned on the cross for your sin. When you put your faith upon him, his, your sin was transferred to him. Second Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says he made him that was without sin to become sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So our sins are transferred to Christ so long as we continue to believe in him. 
So he took the penalty of death because the wages of sin is death. This is why Jesus died on the cross to take our condemnation. But now that we are in Christ, the race has not ended. You know, when people gather to receive awards, there are different feelings. Those who come first celebrate. Even in the hall of reward, there are people who will weep. So the judgment seat of Christ is not like everybody will be celebrating and shouting. It's, you, will, you will be surprised. Because when you get into that room, you will discover something. You will be shown what you were de originally designed to be given versus what you now qualify for because of the life you have lived. <laughs> you know, when Jesus was speaking concerning the twelve disciples, he said, you will sit with me on twelve thrones to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. That means every one of those twelve disciples was designated before the foundation of the world to sit on twelve thrones. Even Judah was there listening. But at the end of life, that throne, there is a man called Matthias that substituted him. He said, his bishopric, let another take. So, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, they will show you, these are the things God designed for you before the foundations of the world. But this is what you qualify for, so take. <laughs> Imagine you show up in this meeting and they tell you, before you came, one million dollars was scheduled for you. But while you were coming from your house, every action you took was used to determine how much will remain. So if you say some things, hundred thousand dollars will be removed. The time you now approach, arrive the hall, they say what is left is ten dollars. You will weep before the judgment seat of Christ. This is why we must take matters of reward very stringent. Some people think, oh, we are saved. That's all that matters. Many who are saved will weep in eternity. Because they will see what was designed for them versus what they received. Because Hebrews 6.10, it says, God is not unjust to forget your labor and works of love that you wrought on his name. So, salvation will take all of us there. Because we don't get saved by anything we do. We get saved by believing in Jesus. So every one of us will get there. But we will not receive reward because of the finished works of Christ. We will be saved because of the finished works of Christ. But we will be rewarded because of our works in grace. That is why Hebrews 12 verse 28. The Bible said, Having received a kingdom that cannot be moved. It said, Let us all serve God. Let us all have grace whereby we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? He said, because our God is a consuming fire. Most of the works that we will have, if they, were, if they are not vetted by God, they will be burnt off. And many will meet Jesus and be ashamed. 1 John 2.28 Project the scripture. Look at what the Bible said. And now, little children, do you know why he's warning little children? They are the ones who didn't grow. I write unto you, children, because your sins have been forgiven you. They are still at the level of taking advantage of grace. We are forgiven so we can lie. We are forgiven so we can fornicate. They are the ones he's warning here. Little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So this is not sinners. These are the children of God who are saved. He said, but it is possible for them to be ashamed when God appears. You will not be ashamed. It's important for me to teach you this so that you will also know what matters in Christianity. Because most of the things we are doing don't matter. They will not count in eternity. Because they don't have the capacity to give us reward. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's getting more quiet. And I like it. Glory to Jesus. Now, let's look at the basis for reward in eternity. Before I begin to talk about some of the things that the Bible points out as the rewards that God will give us. You know, we know. We know what will be the reward already. The only thing is that we don't know the impact of their experience. 
Do you understand? You may, you may want to travel to South Africa now. You know you will travel by plane. But maybe you have never flown, flown in a plane before. So you know how you will go. The only thing is that you have not experienced it. So what I'm teaching you here are things that are revealed in scriptures. We already know what God will reward us with. The only thing is that we don't know the full impact of the experiences. But I will share it with you at least so that you will know what to prepare for. Because when you live every day, your life becomes a preparation to qualify for something. Something that is eternal. Because if you live carelessly, your lifetime would have just been a waste. But let me show you the basis for reward. Before I begin to touch the actual rewards. I outline 10 bases for eternal reward as captured in scriptures. Number one is your heart posture. Jeremiah 17 verse 10. It says, I the Lord. I try the heart. I search the heart. I try the reins. The reins is the conscience. Even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. So, one of the things that will be checked in eternity before a man qualifies for reward at all is the heart posture he sustained in dealing with men and in living his life while he existed on earth. This is why major attacks of Satan is on your heart. Most of the problem you have with men has nothing to do with the people. It's about your heart. When your heart becomes corrupt, your walls will become corrupt. Your actions will become wicked. And you will no longer have reward from your words and your actions. Remember, the Bible said every idle word you speak, it said you will be caught to account for it. So your words matter and your actions matter. But the quality of words you speak and action you speak is a direct revelation of the quality of your heart. And so the heart becomes a vital basis for reward in eternity. This is why any Christianity that does not impact on your heart wasted your time. I know some of these things are no longer emphasized. But the fathers of old, these were some of the central emphasis of their messages. So when they preach forgiveness... They give you a reason why you too must forgive unconditionally. Because you were forgiven unconditionally. When they preach love, they give you a reason why you too must love unconditionally. Because you were loved unconditionally. The whole subject is about the heart. But I can tell you that a large percentage of us today, our heart has been twisted, twisted and twisted. Either because of betrayers or because of jealousy or because of competition. So most of the activities we are carrying out even in church has no reward somebody can be praying to prove a point that is the best prayer warrior somebody can be doing ministry to prove a point to somebody else that is bigger and the whole ministry of 40 years is a wasted life because the heart is wrong now let me add something else to the heart which is the second basis for reward is your motive see God is not moved by what you do as much as it's moved by your motive. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5, hear what the Bible said. It said, judge nothing before it's time. Judgment is not something to rush into. If you enter, if you don't find mercy, you are in trouble. It's a complex and complicated reality. It said, judge nothing before it's time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and we make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then every man shall have praise. Your motives are afraid before you are rewarded. So the second basis for reward is your motive. I'm telling you this so that you will know where to focus in your Christian work. That's why I tell people, listen, fasting, prayer, quoting scripture is useless if some of these things are not achieved. And as I continue, you are going to see how Jesus will put down on some prayer warriors and fasting machines. They are called the Pharisees. They have capacity. They can, a Pharisee can stand here, one posture, and pray for 24 hours. But at the end of the day, he wants you to know that he's a man of prayer. So long as he's able to convince you that to call him a prayer man, he's satisfied. And the Bible said they have their rewards already. You know what their reward is? The applause of men. What a wasted life. Somebody can fast for one, one year 
just to prove to you that if it comes to fasting, this is his realm. He has conquered it. How can you suffer yourself for one year just to make few people know that you can fast? The Bible said all of those things will not have praise of God because the motive is wrong. Action correct, motive wrong. I read for you here last week when I was talking about the heart. How the Bible said Amaziah, the king, did everything that was right in the eyes of God but with a wrong heart. And because of that, the whole action was cancelled. Second basis for reward is the heart. See, when you forgive people, you are doing yourself a favor. Don't cross your leg and sit down and say they must come and apologize. You don't need that. To, you are on a race. The Bible says put aside every weight and every sin that doth easily beset you and run this race with patience. The person may never come and you will get to eternity and discover the reason your 35 years, 60 years, 70 years of life and ministry was a waste was because you were waiting for one inconsequential person to satisfy your ego by saying sorry, it's not necessary. This is why many people are not living. They are reacting. You see them, they start a ministry, they start a business, they are not living. All of that is a reaction. They want to show somebody that they are not failing. Augusta, your life is more important than that. Who are you trying to prove a point to? He's not a God. Don't waste your existence. Do what was written for you. Enjoy it and have reward for it. Motives paramount in the realm of God. Third basis for reward are persecutions that you are able to endure for the name of God. If you can't endure persecution for God, there are certain rewards you will never have. I'm going to show you in eternity we are not equal. See, make no mistakes about it. In salvation, all of us are equal because we receive the same eternal life. We receive the same anointing. We receive the same Holy Ghost. We receive the same righteousness. But in the kingdom, we are not the same. And I will show you some of the rewards God will give that makes us or brings inequality to our stature as far as kingdom is concerned. Those who run away from persecution are running away from certain rewards of eternity. Hmm. Matthew 5, 11 to 12. It says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He say, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so God is expecting that the intensity of your life should have become conspicuous enough for men to notice. And he say, on the strength of that, Many will persecute you. He said, but don't be broken. See, when you are under persecution and people call you and say, sorry, may God help you. Tell them not to worry. It's a blessing to be persecuted. This is what makes giants in the kingdom. It's a blessing to be persecuted. When the apostles were beaten on account of Jesus, Acts 5.41, the Bible said they returned to their company and they were celebrating. Why were they celebrating? We too have become worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. That is the response to persecution. Not everybody's Christianity has reached a level of persecution. So if your work with God has reached a level where men persecute you, happy are ye. It's a basis for reward. And I will show you specific rewards that are given only to men who are persecuted. Specific. Only those who are persecuted. Number four, basis for reward, righteous works. Like refusing to compromise, like self-denial, all of these things hold great weight before God. Revelations. Hmm. First Corinthians 3.14 If any man's it says, if any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he said he shall receive a reward. Colossians 3, 23, 24. He said, whatsoever you do, he said, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord shall receive the reward of the Lord. You shall receive the reward of the inheritance. 
For ye serve the Lord Christ. Every righteous work, listen, it may not receive commendation on earth, but there's a reward for it in, in heaven. As some of you listening to me, you have lost a job because you refused bribe. And then you thought God will show up. And God didn't show up. And after five years, you were suffering. And you started regretting. I, if I knew, I would have followed everybody. Never regret for standing in righteousness. Never regret for taking the place of righteousness. The Bible said, that is the basis for reward. It's not every message that is preached with words. Certain messages are preached by actions. Dogged actions that refute compromise. Dogged actions that showcase self-denial. Every time you stand your ground and say no, something was credited in heaven. You may not receive anything commensurate in time. Don't be perturbed. I know a man who was sacked from a lucrative job in the 90s. Very lucrative job. Up until the 2000s. The guy didn't have any other job. If you are there, you will be tempted to regret. But if you are not careful, that may be the only thing that will give you stand in heaven. Please, listen. The Christianity we have now that makes people think, oh, it's all about breakthrough, won't give us much in the world to come. In the 80s in this country, if somebody tells you he's a Christian, you can leave your house for that person and travel. You know everything is intact. But now, if a man tells you he's a pastor, you take cover. What has happened? The message of the cross has been substituted. We are no longer teaching people things that give them relevance in eternity. We are under pressure to succeed in this life and to prove a point that we are doing well. And we are not creatures of time. We are creatures of eternity. We came to represent a government that is not of this world. And so our focus is not primarily what earth can give. It's primarily who we can become when we return to God. This is why you must understand the scales of balances as far as eternity is concerned. Because most of the scales we are working with are defective scales. They are scales that, that the world gave to us. I was sharing with somebody recently and he was telling me the pressure many ministers go through. Pressure! Either to have large congregation, it's not about soul winning. It's not that, oh, we are winning souls and bringing people to the kingdom. No. Your, co your congregation gives you capacity to speak in certain meetings. Why some ministers are under pressure to receive certain titles of bishop, of archbishop. Now, there are those who have grown and are overseers and there's nothing wrong to be ordained a bishop. But I'm telling you, there are people who are not even overseeing anybody. But they need to be called bishop so that they will have some stature in sharing formula. So that they will have some stature when ministers gather. Because if you come and you are a bishop, there is a seat allocated. And we have forgotten that all of this human and earthly pressure has nothing to do with eternity. So people are not focusing on things that will give them relevance. In the world to come. Righteous works. Check your life. How many things have you suffered. Because you took the stand for truth. How many things have you suffered. If you can't mark them. It means your Christianity is shallow. Because I'm telling you. The more you join in this life. The more you come between the divide. Either to stand for truth or to compromise and go the way of error. And God is watching those who even in the midst of the fire, they will say no. King, we will not be careful to answer you in this matter. Even if our God does not save us, we know our God has the power to save us. But even if he chooses not to save us, we will not bow. We will rather burn in the fire. And it's not a bluff. When they were taking them close... <laughs> You know, you can say some things hoping that something will happen. The king said, so you thought I was joking. Go and hit the fire seven times hotter. The people had to start beating. We thought when we spoke boldly, he would say, let's go. The king, the devil doesn't bluff. Him. Make the fire seven times hotter. They were watching. No thunder in heaven. No lightning in anywhere. They carried ropes and tied them. Uh -uh, God, 
You say, if we speak on your behalf, we show up. Nothing is happening here. They dragged them to the fire and they were swinging them to throw them. One, two, ah, ah, Jesus, you will come here. Wait, wait, wait. Excuse me. Can I change my mind? If God doesn't show up and they tell you, when they swing you and you approach the fire, you feel the heat. Am I entering this fire? Is it not better to change my mind and repent later and ask for forgiveness? The guy said, Oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. This is non-negotiable. And when they threw them, guess what? It was in the fire God showed up. Because your conviction must be justified. And guess who noticed God first? It was the king. Who is the fourth man in the fire? He said, he looks like the son of God. That means even the king knows the son of God. But there is a type of witness that attracts the attentions of kings. In that fire, when they walked out, nobody will tell the king to kneel down. Because he has seen the king of kings. Do you know why the world don't listen to us? We bow to everything the world is bowing to. Those who enter the fire, the king revered them. And when they talk, nations hear. Righteous works. Number five. Basis of reward. Acts of kindness. Acts of kindness. Luke 14 verse 12 to 14. It said, then said he also to him that bade him. It said, when thou makest a dinner or a supper. It said, call not thy friends nor thy brethren neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbor, lest they also be thee again, and a recompense be made unto thee. Don't only show kindness where you will be paid back. He said, rather, when thou makest a feast, he said, call the poor. Go back to the verse. Call the maimed, the lame, and the blind. These people can't pay you back. This is the kind of act that produce reward. If all the people you show kindness to are those who will repay, that's transaction. Your reward is the repayment that they give you. But everything you do to people who can't give you back, God is taking note. That's why I say kindness shown to the poor is an act of worship. It says, He that giveth to the poor lendeth to the Lord. Of the Lord he must be recompensed. Look at what Jesus said in verse 14. Go to the next verse. And thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot repent thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. So every act of kindness you do to those who can't pay you back. There is a ledger where it is recorded. It says at the resurrection you will receive every payment back. This is why when you help the poor, don't make a show of it. If you make a show of it and men applaud you, it's over. But if you do it with the intention of helping them, for helping them, the Bible said at the resurrection, God will bless you. I know there are NGOs, there are ministries that people partner with. And so for the purpose of accountability, you need to show them what you are using their money for. So they don't think you are using the money for something else. But you must be sure that your motive is pure. Let this thing not be for people to begin to sing your praise and say you are a philanthropist. You are a philanthropist. No. Do it from the heart of helping them for no gain. The Bible said if you live like that, you will have a reward. These are the pillars of true Christianity. As you are taking note of them, be extraying them. Most of the things we do in Christianity, go and check your Bible. There is no reward for it in eternity. These are the things that have assurance in the age to come. And you'll be shocked that some of us never do these things. Acts of kindness. Luke 6, 35. Jesus said, extend it even to your enemies. He said, but love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and you shall be the children of the highest for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. For your reward shall be great. He emphasized it 
these are the kinds of people that will receive great reward in heaven. You will be shocked that some of us who are general overseers, some of us who are apostles, prophets, and intercessors, we will go to heaven and you will be amazed that people who never championed, who never seemingly championed any spiritual things, you will see them walking in high places in Zion. And you will be wondering, Lord, what is going on here? Ah, I am a, a general overseer, over 40 churches. What was happening? Is the usher in your church that will now be? Hey! Lord have mercy. The usher that did all the labor that nobody saw, all the reward is intact. Meanwhile, most of the things you did, 90% is for show up. And you receive, they will tell you that, yes, you collected your reward on earth. That's why they were clapping for you in the stadium. You will say, what do you mean? What did I get from the hand clap? They say, well, that's the one you prepared. May you not squander your reward on it. Acts of kindness. Listen, you don't need to be a millionaire to show kindness. That 200 naira you have, 50 naira can save somebody. It is a disposition that is born out of understanding. That 2,000 you have, 500 can save somebody. And so if you know this is how God thinks, helping others will become part of your budget. You will create part, a budget to assist those who are helpless. I'm telling you, some of us have too much. You go to the filling station to buy fuel. You see some of these young girls and young boys who have not eaten. You, it's up, the way they are even holding the pipe is like they are fainting. You are never moved to give them anything. You are, you are driving in an air-conditioned car. The woman, old woman, who sat by the roadside, roasting corn under the heat, two heat, one from the sun, one from the fire. You buy, you collect the 50 naira chain. You say, Mother, this life, you go work for money, money no easy. You are correct. According to the law of economics, but according to the law of eternity, you are wrong. This is true Christianity. These are the things God is looking out for. So, if you don't know these things and you don't do these things, the word of God you are hearing at best is making you a theologian. It's not making you a child of God. That's why I say those who show kindness, they shall be called the sons of the highest. It will make you a professional preacher. It doesn't mean you qualify for anything in eternity. Because the parameters God is checking is not who preaches best. It's who lives like God the best. And these are the parameters. Acts of kindness. Number six. Parameter for reward are labors of intimacy. Interacting with a spirit is a labor. Colossians 4.12 It says, Epaphras is one of you. A bond servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Hear me. Sustaining relationship with a spirit is not a joke. It takes a lot of desire a lot of passion and a lot of labor to build a prayer life. It will take you sometimes years before you activate the prayer turbine. It is at that level you start enjoying prayer. But before you get to the level where you enjoy, pray, enjoy prayer, you will labor. A time comes where you, God begins to pull you to prayer. You will be shocked. You will pray for eight months. You have not heard the word. You have not had any vision. No encounter. All you know is that you are praying. And you are there struggling with your watch. Struggling with your alarm. You pa 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 pa. You check it's, it's 12 minutes. Meanwhile, you thought you have journeyed it in the spirit. This will be 12 hours. It's 12 minutes. You say, what is going on? Because it's a vertical journey. In vertical journey, you need a lot of laws to go to work. The law of lift. It takes, you, you have to counter the law of gravity because your anxiety will pull you down. Your sins will pull you down. Your fleshly desire will pull you down. The cares of this life will pull you down. Your crisis with people will pull you down. It will take time. You will pull. You will keep pulling. Trusting God for grace. Sometimes it's after eight months of prayer that you will see something that looks like a blurry vision. Did I see something? Yes, you saw something. You will now labor. Is that that three months? You will now receive a word. And most times, it's not even about what you are praying for. God will now tell you, 
that sister is trusting God for a child. Pray for her. Ah, ah, I've been praying for one year. You have not answered me. Is the sister you are interested in? Yes. It's the journey. Because this type of prayer is not answers you are looking for. It's reward you are looking for. Because there is a labor of intimacy that does not give answer. It gives reward. And I will show you the reward that intimacy produces. But first of all, let's justify it. Matthew 6, verse 5 and 6. Hear Jesus speaking. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. For the Lord to pray, standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the street, that they might be seen of men. He said, verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. So Jesus is telling you, the reason you must pray correctly is because beyond answer, there are rewards to prayer. So how do you carry out this prayer? Next verse, verse 6. He said, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. He said, when thou hast shut the door. This God, Jesus is not saying don't pray in church. That's not the point. He's not saying don't pray on the street. He's not saying hide every time you pray. He's just telling you, don't make a show of prayer. That's the emphasis. He said, when you have shut the door, he said, then pray to thy father, which is in secret. He said, and thy father, which is in secret, shall reward you openly. This is showing you that intimacy produces reward. This is why God expects us to grow in intimacy. Apart from transformation, there is something God gives to his intimates. Even you who is human here, your wife or your husband that you are intimate with, are there not things you give to them, only them, because they are intimate with you? Who told you I can give you what I can give my wife? <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> you, are, you are a joker. <laughs> my God. My God. For example... I can shut down for two weeks and stay with my wife only. I can't give you that time. If you like, jump, touch heaven and come down. I don't have two weeks to give you. Glory to God. So there are certain things that God reserves only for his intimates. Because intimacy commands it. And then the seventh basis for reward is so winning. Bringing others to God. Turning others to righteousness. John 4 36. It says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and him that reapeth may rejoice together. So, everybody who is involved in converting men to God, there's a reward allocated to that person. All these things I'm sharing with you, they have distinct rewards in heaven. So, Every one of us will be decorated with this reward. So how much you can have depends on the degree to, to which you have excelled in all of these things I'm itemizing. This is why I said these are the major essence, relevant essence of Christianity. First Corinthians 3 verse 8. Now he that planted and he that watered are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So win in his labor. So God rewards those who are actively involved in soul winning. Either by praying souls into the kingdom or by actually going out to win people to the kingdom or by giving to sponsor soul winning campaign. This thing has a reward in eternity. Glory to Jesus. And so if you want your life to count beyond time, you must take time and ensure that your Christian work holds these realities as heaviest molecules. Number one, a perfect heart. Number two, right motives. Number three, capacity to endure persecution. Number four, righteous works. Number five, acts of kindness. Number six, labors of intimacy, like prayer, like fasting, like worship, like coming to church to fellowship, there are rewards for it. And number number six, is that six or seven now? So winning. These are basic spiritual realities that sponsors eternal rewards. If these things are not fundamental in your Christianity, 
your eternity will be funny. And when you meet others in eternity, you will regret your lifetime on earth. Because you will realize that you wasted it. Every other thing we do might be important, but they are secondary. These are the primary things that life requires. Because these are the things that will give you relevance in the world to come. Having said this, what then are the rewards that God allocates to those who undertake these realities in the world that is to come? Let's enter the message now. Ah, Elohim, Elohim Adonai. from shame but in the spirit we don't wear clothes we wear the glory and the glory is what covers us from shame in the spirit God can give you robes of righteousness but that robe is not necessarily your covering your covering is the measure of glory that that robe carries because the way spirits dress is different from the way men dress. In eternity, we are going to assume our celestial dimension. And so our clothing cannot be a tuxedo suit. Our clothing cannot be a Versace. Our clothing will be glory. And the measure of glory that you carry is a product of your interaction with the things that are outlined as basis for reward. And there are three things that gives you high level glory in the spirit. And so your Christianity must be built around these things. But before I show you, let me show you what spirits wear. I'll begin with God. Psalm 104 verse 1 and 2. See what God wears. The father of all spirits. So that you understand where I'm going to. Bless the Lord. Oh my soul. Oh Lord my God. Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Are you following this? Go to the next verse. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment? Who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain? What does God cover himself with? Light like a garment. That's the glory. So every spirit wears glory. This is why 1 Timothy 6.16, the Bible said, God dwells in light that is unapproachable. If you enter the spirit and you don't have glory, you'll be naked. And the level of honor and majesty you will command is the function of the measure of glory that you emit. So majesty and honor in the spirit realm is reflected. It's reflected in the similitude of glory. That's why he said God wears glory and majesty. He said he covers himself with glory. So the honor and majesty of God is tied to the light that comes out of God. So if God stands here, all of us will be like darkness because of the brilliance. One of the ways you distinguish Jesus from angels is the intensity of his brightness. Those who have seen God, they, you can't look at him. The brightness will blind you. If God shows up here, the weight and the intensity of his glory, you will faint and you will be blinded. 
Because that is what spirits wear. And it's not only God. Even angels wear glory. Revelations chapter 10 verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. Every time you meet a spirit being, the garment you will always wear will be the glory. Go and read Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2 and see when Ezekiel described God. He was brighter than the sun at his strength. Read Revelation chapter 1. See how Jesus was described. It was illumination of different propensity because the garment of spirit is glory. And so when we are, met, we are, we are transformed into our celestial nature, we will be expected to put on our garment. And the quality of garment we have will be the quality of how we trade with the basis of reward out itemized in scripture. As touching your glory in eternity, three things are a must. Number one is intimacy. Anybody who does not have intimacy with God, if you see him in the spirit, he will be dull in brightness. He will be dull. And that's how demons recognize people who carry God. See, when a demonic spirit shows up here, if you like, be shouting. He's not moved. He will weigh your brightness and he can tear the quality of your Christian life. Because your illumination can tell whether you are a man of honor and majesty or somebody who is still struggling with shame. It is your covering. This is why we must labor in intimacy. Second Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 5, from verse 1 to 5. See what Paul said. The patriarchs knew these secrets. And this is why their lives were heavy on the altar. Because they knew this thing was not just about solving problems. They knew this thing is not just about getting answer. What you wear when the world comes to an end is a function of how deep you are journeyed with God. He said, for we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. If this body is removed, he said there is another thing that will wear. He said it's not made of hands. It is made in heaven. How do you now get clothed with those things? He said for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is in heaven. So Paul is telling us there is a connection between your labor of intimacy and the measure of that garment that you wear. Does it not surprise you that Moses in Exodus 34, 29 to 30, he went up to Mount Sinai and he was there for 40 days, praying and fasting. Suddenly, the same man who went up was descending. Nobody could look at his eyes anymore. What has happened? Transfiguration has taken place. They had to cover his face with a lot of veils because when you engage in intimacy, something happens about the glory economy. Intimacy. Jesus, the same happened with him. Luke 9, 28 to 29. The Bible said, after six days, he took three of his disciples and they went to the mountain. He said, and as he prayed, he told you what he was doing. As he prayed, he said, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to glister. So every time you engage in intimacy, you are transacting in the corridor of glory. This is why we must make it a lifestyle. And so when you get to Zion, the credit and the bandwidth of your intimacy will be remembered. And that will become the basis for which you will be given the measure of glory that you carry. Can you interact with a glory that you are not familiar with? No, you can't. And so the first thing that provokes glory is the level of intimacy. The second thing that provokes glory is the degree to which you are saturated with the word. 2 Corinthians 3.18 It says we all with unveiled faces. I'm showing you why God emphasizes intimacy. He has an implication. All of these are labors in the spirit. And the Bible said 
God will not forget those labors. So the basis for which God will allocate, that's why everything we do has something is representing in time to show you that it's a prototype, a prototype of the true reality. God will not forget those labors. So why you transact glory on earth, you qualify for higher glories in eternity. He said, we all with open faces, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. You can't interact and not be converted. He said, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of God. So the second thing that sponsors the quality of glory you carry, as far as intimacy is concerned, is your intimacy with the world. The first is your intimacy with God in prayer. The second is your intimacy with the world. And the third is your labor of soul winning. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. See what the Bible said. This is why don't let anybody encourage you to pray. Don't let anybody beg you to study the word of God or to meditate. Who you become in eternity depends on it. It said, and they that be wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. See, all of us will not shine the same. The level of illumination, the level of brightness, the level of intensity you carry is directly proportional to your labor on the altar, to your labor with the world, and to your labor with soul winning. So when we get to Zion, don't make the mistake of thinking that they will they correct you with glory because you are called a prophet. Because you are called an apostle. There are many prophets who know nothing about the altar. There are many apostles who know nothing about the business of the world. There are many, many, even worshippers that know nothing about soul winning. And we are floating in church in and out. We think that has an implication in eternity. No, it doesn't. And you may not know the value of clothes until you go there. Like I was telling you last week, Tuesday. Hope you know. A goat does not know the value of a suit. If you put a suit, what? Here we are not funny people. I was in the UK the last time, and I saw people carrying dogs. They dress the dog with clothes. <laughs> you see, dog, they kit the dog up with clothes and some solid garments, and the dog, even though the garment is expensive, the dog is uncomfortable because clothes does not mean anything to the dog. Give a baboon clothes. It doesn't mean anything to the baboon. But you, because you know clothes has relevance in your realm, even among clothes, clothes have difference. There is a suit that can be sold for 10,000. There's another suit that can be sold for 1 million. And there is a suit that can be sold for 10 million. And when you wear them, the difference shows. And it's not just about pride. Even color of clothes has an impact. If you wear black, you can sit anywhere. When you wear white, you put yourself together. That's to tell you that what you wear has implication. Now, if clothes are that relevant in a mundane world like this, think about reality. How many of you can come here if you were not clothed? So you didn't just come here because you knew the location. You didn't just come here because you have sense. You came here because you have clothes. If you don't have clothes, you will hide in your bedroom. Nobody can see you. So a man without garment will live in the realm of shame. And so the degree to which you ebb away shame is the degree to which you are covered. It said in Exodus 28 verse 2, make garments unto Aaron for beauty and for glory. So your beauty in eternity, your honor in eternity, your majesty in eternity is tied to the degree of glory that you carry. And that is the way glory is transacted. He said, they that turn many to righteousness in eternity, he said, they will shine like the brightness of the heavens and like the stars forever. They that trade in the place of prayer, he said, they shall be clothed with their heavenly tabernacle. And he said, they that engage the world, they shall be metamorphosed into the likeness of the spirit that they see. So the degree of glory we carry in eternity is our choice. What we do in intimacy. This is why the devil fights your intimacy. Because he is scared that every time you engage God, something happens about your glory. And he doesn't want you to be glorified. Does it not occur to you? When Adam fell, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What happened when he fell? When he heard God, he hid himself. Because 
he was afraid. There is a shame that brings fear. That is the shame that men who don't have glory carry. But when you are clothed, you can stand before God. You can participate in Zion. This is the first reward that God will give to people. And the Bible calls these kinds of people overcomers. That means no distraction of the world, no cares of this life, no sin was able to separate you from God. Paul asked the question, he said, what can separate us from the love of God? Because he knows the value of this thing in eternity. What can separate us from the love of God? He thought and thought and thought, nothing was found. I pray for somebody today, the power for your intimacy to be re reactivated is released upon you now. Christianity is not about church attendance. It's about relationship with God. Because that relationship sponsors glory. And glory is a reward of eternity. Glory will not just be dished out to people carelessly. You don't win souls. Another person labor to pray, to give, and to win people into the kingdom. You expect that you come to God and He will give you the same glory that He gave that person. No, that's not justice. He said, God will not be unjust to forget your labor of love. It depends on what you do now that you are alive. The second reward of eternity is a name. <laughs> and I wish, <laughs> you know, in the kingdom, name, the meaning of name is deep. In the natural, names are for nomenclature. Nathaniel, yes sir. Michael, yes sir. Godwin, yes sir. That's not kingdom. When you enter the kingdom, names are not for nomenclature. Because in the kingdom, you will know as you are known. That's how it works in the kingdom. If I see you, I will know you. Peter did not live in the era of Moses and Elijah. The moment they appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, they recognized them spot on as Moses and Elijah. You know as you are known. So name in the kingdom carries dimensions and authority. That's why Jesus himself had to be given a name. In Philippians chapter 2, from verse 5 to verse 9. Because these names are end. They are a reward. They are not uh, a gift. They are a reward. Even if you are given a name, if you don't pay the price for that name, you won't answer it. Because in the kingdom, names are symbols of authority and dimensions you can be committed with. So you must earn it. I was teaching you about the name of Jesus here the last time. And I told you, Every time an Israelite or an Israeli person has an encounter with God, he credits that encounter with a name. So that any time that name is called, that dimension is reactivated. Because names carry dimensions. Names carry authority. And so every name a man is called in the kingdom is end. Only overcomers qualify to receive names. And even in the natural, we saw the example. Philippians 2 from verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Next verse. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse, next verse. These are the things Jesus went through to qualify to be called Lord. He said, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Next verse. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What now happens? Next verse. Wherefore. That means the name he's given is a direct consequence of the price he paid. Wherefore, God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. Now, what is the implication of that name? Is it to, to call him? No. He said, at the name of Jesus. Next verse. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven 
and things in earth and under the earth. So the name he was given is to be able to exercise lordship. And so the reason he's able to exercise lordship is because a name was given to him. He said that every tongue should confess that what? That Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he cannot exercise lordship without that name. And that name is not a gift. That name was end. The same applies in eternity. When we get to eternity, something will happen to those of us who will be overcomers. Hear what the Bible said. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 the names you are bearing on earth you may love it but we will not know you after those names in eternity so thank God for Matthew thank God for Enoch, thank God for Moses thank God for Martha, thank God for Magdalene those names are nomenclature the names that will give you authority in Zion you will earn it at the end of time he said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He said, To him that overcome, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save him that receives it. This is what will determine your status in Zion, the name that you will receive. And so, where you will stand in eternity is a function of your name. Because names are passcodes to ranking in eternity. Revelation 3, 12 and 13. Same emphasis, reiterated. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. So you are seeing that this type of people will have a stand in the courts of God. And he said, and I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him a new name. So not everybody will stand in the courts of God. It's only those who earn certain names that will stand there. That's why Gabriel showed up and spoke to Zacharias. He said, your wife Elizabeth shall be with child. And the man doubted him. And the guy looked at him. He said, I am Gabriel. <laughs> oh God. It's not, an, it's not a nameless angel that is talking to you. He said, I am Gabriel. I speak to you and you doubt me without consulting God. He said, you shall be dumb until when this thing happens. He is pending from where he is standing. So, if you want to have authority in eternity, you need a name. This is why you can't joke with names. Names are not for nomenclature. If you can't pass judgment without a name. Because when you say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door, that the king of glory might come in. They will say, who is the king of glory? We want to know by whose authority you are making this proclamation. And when we get to Zion, all of us will reign with him as kings. That is why he needs to give all of us our own passcode. So the second type of reward of eternity is a new name. And the kind of name you are giving is what determines your authority. The question now is, what then is the basis for having a name? I tell you quickly. The basis for which a name is given to men in eternity is their ordination. It's your calling. Everyone who is born was given a calling. The type of name you will be given is dependent on how you execute that call that is on your life. This is why those who are negligent about their calling are taking a great risk. Because that will be the basis for them to be named. Even on earth, when God gives a man a call of necessity, he gives him a name to sustain that call. Because there is something about ordinations and names. Look at Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17 verse 5, 
He said, your name shall no longer be called Abraham, but Abraham, because there is an ordination on your life to be the father of many nations. So, ordinations necessitate names. And that's not all. Look at Simon Peter. In John 1, 42, your name shall no longer be called Simon, but Cephas, which is to be interpreted Peter, because you shall be a rock, because of his calling. A man who floats up and down cannot be the leader of the apostles. So the ordination warranted a new name. And that's not all. Even Paul was previously called Saul. Acts 13 verse 9. But when he entered this calling, Saul could no longer suffice. And so the Bible said Paul, who was also called Saul, because he needed a new, a new name that can warrant that ordination. And that is not all. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, Mark 3, 17. Jesus changed their names to sons of thunder. Your calling demands certain names. And so when you fulfill those calling, names will be attributed to you as an eternal reward. So in eternity, they will know us after the dimensions that we carry. So some of us may be sons of light. Some of us may be door openers. Some of us may be city takers. But it depends on what you did with your call. This is why you cannot allow your calling to be dormant. There are many people who get offended because they didn't treat them well in church and they left and their calling died. Are you joking? Who told you ministry ends on earth? Ministry does not end on earth. Ministry continues into eternity. Did you not read about Moses and Elijah? After they went to Zion, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they came back as elders. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. And they were coming to submit their testimonies to the kingdom. And they were telling Jesus what he will do in Jerusalem. Because the work does not end on earth. You are called as an intercessor. You are called as an apostle. The project of earth might end, but the project of God continues. He is the one that sits in the cycles of eternity. And when we complete our calling in this phase of existence, we become participators of the next agenda. Can I show you a scripture? Revelation 22. Revelation 22 verse 9. He said, Then said he unto me, See, see thou, do it not. Because when this guy was carrying John around heaven, showing him things, so when he finished, John wanted to worship him. He said, No, don't do it. John thought he was a, an angelic functionary or even the Christ. He said, no. See thou that thou do it not. He said, for I am thy fellow servant. Another version said, I am thy one of your brethren. He said, for of and of thy brethren, the prophets. So this is a prophet. But this guy finished his prophetic ministry and became a messenger in heaven. And John went to heaven and the guy was carrying John around heaven. John thought he was an angel because he was clothed. <laughs> the glory he wore is not the garment that you wear on earth anymore. He had taken off the earthly and he has put on the celestial. So when he, John saw the glory, John mistook him for one of the elders of Zion. He said, no, I am one of thy fellow servants. I am one of thy brethren among the prophets. So prophets don't finish their ministry on earth. When you finish your ministry on earth, you translate to your ministry in eternity. And most prophets who are accurate become elders. That's why Moses and Elijah came back as elders. So, you may have a calling. You are thinking it's about the body of Christ. The, the body of Christ is a measure of the call. The real call is who you become in the assembly of Zion. Because we will continue serving in the world to come. Did you read Revelation 14 verse 4? Open it and see. He said, there are those who follow the Lamb everywhere He goes. So we don't follow Him only on earth. Even in eternity, we keep following. He said, these are they which were not defied with women. He said, for they are virgins. He said, these are they which follow the Lamb. 
wheresoever he goeth. He said, this were redeemed from among, from among men, being the first fruit unto God and to the Lamb. So, these are people who have a calling of consecration and they kept it. Some of them, Matthias. Some of them, Levites. Some of them, Nazarites. They refuse to be defied. The Bible said, at the end of time, they will walk with the master as the soldiers. Everywhere he goes, they have access to go there because they kept their ordination. So, this thing does not end in time. You can continue to order a young. Why do you think angels have names? An angel comes to you and say, I'm Gabriel. An angel comes to you and say, I'm Michael. Those names are signatures of service. So, even after their era was over, they became messengers to other dispensation. Who is Melchizedek? He said, he's without father. He's without mother. That means he's not talking about God. Who is he? When you serve and you are done, another assignment is handed to you. See, some of us will be messengers in the world to come. It doesn't end here. Did you not read? The Bible said, those who overcome, he shall give authority over nations. That means in the world to come, some will become governors. So in the world to come, there will be rulers of cities. Even though they have become just men made perfect. Because ordination continues. But the signature of authority you have to continue your ordination is the type of name that you'll be given. This is why whatever assignment God gives you now, die on it. There will be multitude in heaven. Don't be lost inside them. It's not enough to go to heaven. <laughs> oh Lord, of us, the King of glory, Yahweh, Sabaho, Yahweh, Sabaho, oh Lord, of us, the King of glory, Yahweh. of you as prophets. And then you gave word of knowledge to two people. And because one or two people know you, you already compromised. You don't know the world to come. If you know the honor of the age to come, you will reject anything men give you. Some prophets compromise for fame. Some compromise for money. Some compromise for relevance. Others compromise for position. Which position can equal to become an elder in Zion? That means it's already an honor to be called into the lineage of prophets. Your focus should not be the most accurate prophet. Your focus should not be the most popular prophet. That when you are also done with your assignment, you will line up behind Abraham. You will line up behind the Elijahs. You too will become an elder in Zion. Who told you? See, when people see what we do, they don't understand the substance of our passion. They think you want to be popular. Oh God, some of us are intelligent too. If my focus is about popularity, I won't be here. I won't be here. I know what to do for my name to explode in one week. There are certain controversial things. If I touch it, internet will explode. If I even begin to project my personal life, I can have drama. Everywhere they will be watching me. Go and check my page. I only put kingdom stuff there. Maybe once in a while I'm doing birthday, I just... We are not positive. We know what to do, sir. You think if I start a series now and I'm showing people about my relationship and family life, it will be millions, millions, millions. If I begin to deal with controversial issues or touch attack things now, everybody wants to hear what I said. But that's not my focus. 
Everywhere you see my, my platform or anything about me is the word of God. I project only the word and I'm satisfied. People say, they think you are ambitious, you are past. If I am ambitious, sir, I won't be here. Those who are around me know the opportunities that come. I've been to, see, just face your calling. You know why? Jesus said concerning apostles, he said they will sit with him on thrones to judge Israel. I want to become a judge in the world to come. Because why prophets become elders, apostles become judges. That's why even on earth we judge things. So my goal is not to be the biggest apostle in time. You can be the most popular apostle in time, but you may not make it as a judge in Zion. So those are the things we pursue. We know that ministry transcends time. And we want to do ministry even in the world that is to come. Because there is a name that you can be given that will give you access to serve even in Zion. Oh Lord of hosts, the King only name you will bear. Because by the time your journey is completed, God will give you a new name. You will qualify for a new name. You will be part of the overcomers that will be given a new name. So that your relevance will transcend time. I prophesy over you. Everything trying to make a mess of your ordination, they go down now. Please hear me. The glory of ordination it's not popularity. It's a burden. You are not yet popular. That's why I think it's a big thing. It's a burden. From people who assume you are a millionaire and every day they are begging you for money to not having your privacy. People budgeting on you all the time. If, if you are not even focused, you will lose your calling. Popularity is a burden. That's not the goal for the nation. If God tells you, sit in one room and pray till you return to Zion, do it with joy. The excellency of ordination is the name you will qualify for at the end of time. What will God call you? What will He call you? When He gathers the servants and He looks at some and says, Faithful servant, what will you be called? That's what we pursue. Your calling may be to, to help the needy. Do it with all your life. Take dressing from people like Mother Teresa. Give yourself to it. Beyond what men can give you, there is a name waiting for you in Zion. This is why every one of us must be about the master's business. There is a name we contend for, and you will not miss your own. Sit down for a moment. Eternal reward. Number three is the tree of life or the hidden manna. Revelations 2. Verse 7. Hmm. Yahweh. It's a he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. He said to him that overcometh. He said, Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God? To him that overcometh. He said, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 17. Reiterated, Revelation 2, 17. He that hath an ear. This type of thing is not for those who have ears. It's for an ear. <laughs> so if you don't pay attention and prioritize it, you can't know it. It's not a common message. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. He said to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna. So there is a hidden manna that God will give to some people. Please note some of the things 
that form the basis or the precursor for attaining these rewards and focus on them. That's the substance of the message. I told you to have glory, you must pay the price of intimacy. You must pay the price of soul winning. Intimacy in prayer, intimacy with the word, and soul winning. That's the key for glory. And I told you, for you to have a name, you must focus on your calling and your ordination. At the end of time, God will judge you based on your assignment. He will not judge an intercessor like an evangelist. And he will not judge an apostle like a politician or a leader. All of us will be judged based on our assignment. That's why there's no room for competition. You are an intercessor. You are under pressure because an evangelist is popular. You don't need popularity. You need stamina on the altar. You are a pastor. You want to compete with the governor. You are not a leader in civic society. The road God gives to them is different from the one he gave you. Focus on your assignment. Stay on your lane. You will be judged based on your calling. And then number three, the third reward is the hidden manna. What is the basis for this reward? It is the degree to which you can keep the secrets of God, the oracles of God, and the commandments of God. When God gives you instruction, the degree to which you obey it will also form the basis for eternal reward. That's why when God is talking to you, tremble. Ask Him for grace. You know, many people, God has given them instruction. They sang it to the whole world and they did nothing about it. The Lord has told me to go to Ghana. The Lord has told us to go to Jamaica and they never go. And God keeps churning out commandments and they never obey them. On the last day, those commandments will rise up and judge you. Because those words are not volume. It's God communicated to you. So you will come before Christ and the instruction he will give you will rise up. Did you not read what Jesus said? He said, these words you have heard, they will judge you on the last day. So the instructions God gave you that you refuse to keep, they will take on body and they will rise up and tell you, we were the ones sent to you. You refused to what? You refuse to obey us. And on the strength of that, you will lose out on your reward. Because commandments are basis for reward. Revelation 22 verse 14. Let me add some speed now. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right so this tree of life he's talking about here is not eternal life. Book. I will show you what it is. Blessed are they that do his commandments. He said that they may have the right to eat the tree of life and they may enter through the gates into the city. So not everybody will have the right to eat of the tree of life. Not everybody will have the right to possess the hidden, the hidden manna in the world to come. If they that do his commandments. So, some people already have lost out three rewards in eternity. Imagine what their eternity will look like. They are not clothed with glory. They are naked. They don't have a name. So, there's no assignment for them in the world to come. They will just be looking around, looking for which room where they are singing to join. Why other people are serving God actively. And to make this worse, even the hidden manner, they don't have. Meanwhile, the Bible says his commandments are not grievous. But most of us are irresponsible towards the commandments of God. Why is this important? The keepers of his commandments are considered his true lovers. So this is actually an award for those who are deeply intimate with God. John 14, 15. See what Jesus said. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments. So the hidden manner is for those who love God and demonstrate his love by keeping his commandments. Now, there are some of us here, the basic rudiments of scripture we can't obey. You read it for them in black and white, they say, brother, they didn't know it's you. 
they can obey the basic rudiments of scripture. Let me show you one simple biblical commandment that God gave. 1 John 3, 23 to 24. Look at a simple commandment just to give you an idea. The kind of rebellion that we are manifesting. He said, and this is his commandment that we should believe on his name. That's the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. But most of us can't love one another. Because what is love for one another? Patience, kindness, temperance, goodness, mercy. We can't do it. We are backbiting ourselves. We are accusing ourselves. We are competing with ourselves. And these things are supposed to be the basis that qualify us to eat of the hidden manner. What is the implication? What does the Bible mean when it speaks about the hidden manner? It's not necessarily something you are collecting to bite. He's speaking about access to the throne. The hidden manner speaks about access in the realm of God. There are certain access you will not have. See, don't make the mistake of thinking when the world ends, all of us will see God. It's not everybody that will see God. Some of you who have not seen God on earth, if you are not careful, you may not see God forever and ever. God will be a story that somebody will tell you. They will tell you as a story on earth and they will tell you as a story in eternity. Did you not read? Even Jesus himself teaching is the day that are pure in heart, they will see God. So, seeing God is not for everybody. It's a gift. It's a gift that those who keep his commandment qualify for. Let me read another scripture. <laughs> How can you go to heaven when you don't see God? You are hearing sound. They say, yes, that's the throne room. God is now addressing overcomers. You say, eh, how, how is the throne like? Where does he sit? They'll say, don't, uh, may you reach the throne room. <laughs> reach, reach the throne room. <laughs> don't let me tell you about the throne in heaven. No. Let's discuss it together because you will be there. <laughs> On earth, they are describing God for you. Even in eternity. They tell you, when you enter the throne room, the throne room is, is, is towards the east gate. And there's a river that flows from the throne. There is the sea of glass. From the waist of God up, you can't see it. It's like the stone. But the leg, and, and you're also in heaven. Because you refuse to keep the instructions that God gave you. And forever and ever, you'll be banished. Revelation 22 verse 14. He said, Blessed are they that do his commandment. They will have the right to the tree of life and they may enter. So this is talking about access. They may enter into the city of God. Revelations 22 verse 1 to 3. See where they will enter. And he showed me a pure river of water, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of the Lord. Next verse. In the midst of the tree of it, in the midst of the street of it, and on the other side of the river was there the tree of life. So, that's why I told you, when he's talking about accessing the tree of life, he's talking about coming into the throne room. You know, when John went there, he saw 24 elders. He saw four beasts. And Gabriel said, I stand in the presence. So, it's not a place for everybody. It's a place for certain people who keep his commandment. That's where the river flow from. He said, there is the tree of life. So, the tree of life is in the throne room. Only those who keep his commandment can have access to enter there. That's why you can be in heaven and weep. That's why you can be in heaven and be stranded. Revelation chapter 5, from verse 1 to 5. John was in heaven, and the Bible said a scroll was opened concerning the destiny of men. It said no man was worthy to open it. Because it's a realm of qualifications. And John was weeping there. And a strong angel was there and didn't know. Until one of the creatures of the throne room showed up. He said, one of the elders spake unto me. He said, weep not. He said, behold, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, he has prevailed. So many will be in heaven and they will be stranded. They will be in heaven and they will not know what is happening. 
They will say, stand up. God, is, they are worshipping now. They will stand up. Come on, brother. You will be there. Glory to God. Number four. The fourth reward of eternity are crowns. This is where the true separation is about to begin. Not everybody will wear crown in heaven. And I will show you the implication of crowns. Because on earth, crown is for fashion. Well, at least, even on earth, there are certain crowns that are for royalty and authority. You know, the crown of a king is not fashion. So, when the Bible speaks about crowns, it's beginning to enter matters of everlasting government and eternal governance. Because in the world to come, God will allow some of us to participate in rulership. But there is a qualification. There are certain that we co-rule with God. And there are certain that will be ruled forever and ever. So when we hear about crowns and thrones, they are rewards for those who qualify to become cabinet members in Zion. Because there are different court sessions in heaven. For different legislation or legislative acts. Even among us here, you know, we are not the same as far as kingdom is concerned. There is a crown that somebody wears and there is a throne he sits on. And he can say, subsidy is gone. If you like, shout. He will whisper and the whole nation will shake. You will shout and go to jail. So it's, it's not about volume. It's about throne and crown. That's how kingdom operates. And then you can be from Benue and say, I'm a proper Benue man. I'm a thief man. I'm an Idoma man. The senator will go there and say, we don't need light. <laughs> if you like, kill yourself. There will be no light. Because there, only three talk. There are over four million people in Benue, but it's three that talks in House of Senate. Three. Three people. Three. Out of four million. If you like, be ten million is three. It's the three that sit on those crowns, wear those crowns and sit on those thrones that will speak on your behalf. So the best you can do is to pray for them to talk well. And sometimes, when they show them on TV, you discover that your own senator was sleeping. <laughs> when deliberations were going on. And the sleep of your senator means your, your state and your constituency have lost some major allocations. Just five minutes sleep is equivalent to four years allocation. That's the significance of crowns and thrones. Do you get what I'm saying? So in Zion... We will not be the same. Some of us will be government agents. And the first qualification to become an, a celestial government agent is that you will wear crowns. Let me read some scriptures for you. James. Or Revelations 2.10. Let's begin from there. Please write these scriptures down. I can preach this message. If I'm preaching this message, you won't sit. But I want you to write these scriptures. Go and read them. Let God talk to your heart. So that you don't miss anything. I'm showing you what you will wear in Zion. If you go to Zion and you see a Christian wear a crown and you don't have, check your head quickly. Know that you have lost something. If you enter, if you enter heaven, first thank God for escaping hell. <laughs> that one is, is threshold. But after you enter... Look at your... If you are not shiny, know that you are naked. There are many meetings they won't invite you because you are naked. So you will be in heaven. You will not have access to breaking news. And then check your head. If there is no crown there, it means forever and ever you will be governed. You will be ruled. And some rulers in eternity, the Bible said they will rule with the rod of iron. Funny. But this is the reality of forever and ever. He said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He said, Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, 
that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. He said, Be faithful unto death. I thought Jesus will save us from death. There are certain deaths that is an honor in the kingdom. He said, Be faithful what? Unto death. Why? He said, Be, he said, and I will give you the crown of life. So the crown of life is the reward for martyrs. If your conviction for Jesus is not strong enough for you to be willing to die for him, your head will be empty in eternity. If you cannot endure trials for Jesus, you will have no crown in eternity. Now, this does not necessarily mean your head will be cut off. It means self-denial. It means abnegation on account of the kingdom. The Christians that compromise for every threat, every trial, every tribulation, they will never wear crowns in eternity. Because it's an entrustment that gives you governmental powers. It is only for those that can entrust their lives to God in the service of his kingdom. And this is replete in scriptures. James 1.12 Blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord promised to them that love him. So you can't receive crowns without trials. You can't receive crowns without the spirit of martyrdom. And in the kingdom, only those who have the baptism of martyrdom can truly be witnesses. Because in Acts 1 8, where he says, You shall be witnesses unto me, the word is maturaya. Is one who is willing to die for Christ. These are the people that qualify for crown. And this is what they are not teaching us in the faith. All we are hearing is prophecy from January to December. We are the men who can suffer for God. Those men are no more. But when you read church history, they don't even write people's birthdays. Nobody cares when you came. They are interested in how you left. Because the death of men was a testimony to their generation. But today, all we celebrate are pleasures of life. I got a car. I got a promotion. I got a breakthrough. Nothing wrong with it. We see people who receive those blessings here. But if that's all we have, then we are people who are using God just to enjoy this life. We are not kingdom agents. I quoted for you already. Acts 5.41 They flogged this man. They were happy. To them, it was an honor to suffer persecution for Jesus. Why don't we have such Christians today? Today, when they arrest the man of God, everybody is threatening. Yeah, something will happen. What will happen? Because we think kingdom is politics. Death is part of our witness. I'm not saying we should not support those that are arrested. If they arrest me tomorrow, do something. <laughs> it shows love and loyalty. But hear me, in case nothing happens, celebrate God that I don't change my mind. You know why? If I die there, it's a testimony. So our body should not be, we will break everywhere. No, that's not how we fight. When Peter was arrested, the church prayed. So it is love and loyalty to do something. If we don't do anything, it means we don't love God. It means we don't love ourselves. But what we do is not threat, is to go and pray to God. Why are we even praying? in case that person's assignment is not yet over. But if his assignment is over, if you pray him out, you didn't help him. The Bible said they arrested James, killed him. And that became a testimony to the church. He said when he saw that he pleased the Jews, he took Peter and prayer was made of the church. So the church will not be irresponsible. But if you die, it's a testimony. That's the key to the crown of life. And I'm not saying you must die or your head should be cut off. When we speak about death for Christ, we are talking self-denial. What do you die to every day so that Jesus will be glorified? That is what gives you a crown. Because you must not be slaughtered to wear that crown. But you will go through trials that is equivalent to death. Most of you, they will tell you, if you don't compromise, you will not be promoted. They should keep their promotion. Most of you, they will tell you, if you don't compromise, they will not give you a role in your career. They should keep the role. You are not a hireling. Listen, promotion does not come from the west. It does not come from the east. It does not come from the south. It comes from the Lord. And in case that promotion does not come, it's an honor to die for God. 
this is the Christianity that the apostles practiced. And this is why, out of Jesus' disciples, all were recorded to be martyred. Only John's death was not known. And none of them changed their mind. Does that mean Jesus was raising martyrs? Yes. That is the true essence of the kingdom. If we sitting here, you can't find 20 people who can die for Jesus. It means this is a social gathering. We are just wasting our time. I read the story of an Egyptian church. 38 people were arrested. And they gave them the opportunity for one month to change their minds. They refused. They slaughtered them one after the other. You are seeing they are slaughtering the next person. They are coming to you. Nobody shook. When I heard that story, I started praying to God to help me. Because I said, if I was there, will I have the fortitude to die? If I don't have that kind of grace, then what message have I been preaching? Go and read how the 12 disciples died. Some of them were stoned to death. Some of them, they, they used prayer and thrust through them. They stood their ground for Jesus. The Bible said, even the ones that they gave deliverance, they rejected it so that they can have a better resurrection. What did they know? Imagine, they arrest you to kill you. When they saw that you won't change your mind, they said, go, won't kill you again. They said, no. I want the church to hear that there are still men who can die for Jesus. It said, some, in the face of deliverance, they rejected it. Because they want to resurrect with crowns. What is it about crowns they know that we don't know? That we can, we can lie because of 10,000 naira extra on our salary. That we can lie because we want a boss to pat us at the back and say you are my best staff. That we can lie and join church politics because we want people to clap for us. What is it about crowns that we don't know? Our Christianity is shallow because we are not teaching the cross. We don't know the way of death anymore. But in the kingdom, honor is not men's applause. Honor is the degree of cross that you can carry. And this is the signature of those who can wear the crowns of eternity. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7 to 8, he said, I fought a good fight. This thing is called the fight of faith. Many times it will stagger your conviction, but you will stand your ground. See, we need tough Christians. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. There is such a thing called the faith that many kept. Verse 8 is the henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day, and not me only, but unto them that love is appearing. This guy knew the level of death I have endured. There's no way the crown will escape me. Because we know these things. If you die for Christ, you will know. And blessed are you. If you have found grace enough not to bow. If you have to die literally, it's an honor. But you don't even have to die literally. It speaks about self-denial. What can you let go because of the kingdom? Hmm. Oh, give me the earth. Oh, God, oh, give me That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. What is the significance of crowns? I give you three quickly. Number one, it makes you part of heaven's government. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. <clears throat> After this, I looked and behold. A door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was rainbow round about the throne. In sight like unto an emerald. Verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders. Sitting, clothed with white raiment. You see that these guys carry glory. That's number one. Number two. On their heads they had crowns. And number three. They were sitting on thrones. So what qualifies you to be part of heaven's government? 
is glory, crown, and throne. And all of these things have to do with certain kinds of labors that qualify you for it. For a crown is death. Second thing that those who wear crown are permitted to do in eternity is that they will participate in the wars of the bridegroom. So there are those who will, who will resurrect as warriors. Those are the ones who will fight the battles of Elohim. See, not all of us will participate in the warfare of eternity. Because if you don't have the fortitude to stand your ground in the face of death, you can't fight the rage of the battle to come. Not the battle of Armageddon, let alone any other one for that matter. Revelation 6 verse 2. Quickly. And round about the throne. Revelation 6 verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So if you don't have crown, you don't have the capacity to conquer. So in the war to come, every warrior has a badge. That badge is the crown. So if you think you will be part of those who will fight with God, stand with God, you must pay the price to be crowned. And it's also a key for dominion. That means those who wear crown have the permission to exercise dominion. That's why that scripture tells us that he will conquer and he will go to conquer. The fifth reward of eternity, maybe I'll stop here today, are thrones. When we get to heaven, some will be in the city. Some will be outside Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. Some will stand in the courts of God and some will sit on thrones. We will not all be in the same place. Please, make no mistakes about it. See, the beauty of life is that you have all the opportunities to become anything in the world to come. You just have to know it and align yourself. Whether you be in the nations, or you be outside the war, or you be standing in the courts, or you be seated, it's your choice. It's your choice. But there are prizes to pay. See, when we talk of prizes, we are not talking about salvation. Salvation is free. But there are many things in the kingdom. When we are saved, we are restored into kingdom business. Because kingdom was what was in view before we fell. Salvation was to restore us back to kingdom. Now that we are in the kingdom, kingdom service begins. And these are some of the services of the kingdom. But most Christians are too babyish to even know these things. Because they were never taught. They thought Christianity is about is a social gathering. Where they lay hands on you, you are healed. Where they give people food, where is deeper than that. Those are the peripheries. This is the real business of Abba. What is interested in? These are the things. And that is why rewards are based on these things. What qualifies you for thrones? Number one, trials. Number two, tribulations. Number three, chastisements of the Lord. The chastening of the Lord. Anybody who runs from trials, who runs from tribulations, who runs from the chastening of the Lord, will never sit on a throne. Revelations. Well, let's begin. From Luke 22, verse 28 to 30. He said, Yea, are they which have continued with me in my temptations. This is not everybody. Those who have what? Continued with him in his temptation. These are the people who take reproach for the name of God. Insult for the name of God. Pains, peris for the name of God. He said, you are they that continued with me in my temptations. Next verse. He said, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. Next verse. And he said, and you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the tribes of Israel. So there are those who he will appoint thrones to sit with him to pass judgment in the world to come. So it's not only God that will judge in the world to come. 
there are many judges in, in Zion. But anybody who will qualify for this honor must be willing to go with him in his trials. Must willing, be willing to go with him in his tribulations, in his temptations, in his peril. Some of us, we are even so big, we don't want the risk of being seen with Christians. When people are going for evangelism in your street, that day you won't come. Because you don't want people to start saying, you have joined these people. Some of you can't even carry Bible and walk on the street. Bible. If you hold it and you, you, will, hide, you will hide it in leather. Let them not see you that you are walking with Bible. You will, you will stand in the, in, outside of Jerusalem forever and ever. So your knees be strong. Revelation 3, 19 to 21. Let me read fast so that we, we round up. <laughs> Christianity, see, a lot of Christianity depends on trials, tribulations, sufferings for the name of Jesus. A lot in Christianity depends on intimacy. A lot in Christianity depends on philanthropy, good, good and care for your world. A lot in Christianity is dependent on the depths that you can journey with God. Most of the things we do are too shallow. Too shallow. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He said, be zealous therefore and repent. Next verse. Behold, I stand at the door. Are you seeing that this is chastening? And knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Next verse. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. So if you don't go through trials, if you don't go through tribulation, and if you don't endure the chastening of the Lord, you will never sit on thrones. Why are thrones important? Why is it a type of reward? Thrones give you the right to be a judge and to co with God. And these are some of the highest privileges in the world to come. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 to 3. So those who will be opportune to sit on thrones, they are rulers in the age to come. They will co-rule with the Father. He said, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? He said, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So there is a provision God has made available to us to judge the world and to judge angels. But that provision is not for every saint. That's why Luke twenty two twenty eight 28 said, you are the ones that continued with me in my trials. He said, because of that, I will appoint unto you to sit with me on thrones to judge the tribes of Israel. To judge. What an honor. These things are beyond all the privilege of, privileges of life. That when your time on earth is past, you go to heaven and you are invited. You are summoned to be inducted into the judges of eternity. And they give you a crown. They give you a robe. And they give you a throne. And forever and ever, you are exercising judgment and dominion. What else it is to look for? I will stop here. But go and study. I'll give you two more. The sixth reward is power over nations. You know, at the end of time, nations will be judged. Some nations will disappear. <laughs> you know, the Bible said, a new heaven and a new earth will appear. The new earth, only the nations that are judged 
we reflect in that new earth. Hope you know, even right now, there are some nations God has judged that have disappeared. Like Sodom and Gomorrah. So, some nations will vanish. They will not exist again. This is why nations must be taught the word of God. There are certain nations that from the beginning of time, they have shut the door to the gospel. <laughs> oh my God. Some nations will not appear in the world to come. Because in the judgment of nations, they will be burnt off like Sodom and Gomorrah. But you see, every nation that will make it, those who overcome, God will give them authority to be rulers over those nations. And each nation has dispensations. That's why the Bible speaks of the time of John. So, if you come to a nation that survived or subsist, there are many dispensations in those nations that will have different rulers depending on the degree of authority that they are given to. So, if you read your Bible, in Revelation 22, in fact, if you read from verse, Revelation 21, verse 1 to 5, you will see that a new heaven and a new earth will appear. And a new Jerusalem will descend from heaven. And the Bible said that city, from verse 22 to 27, will not need a tabernacle. It said God will be its tabernacle. It will not need the sun. God will be the light of that city. And in chapter 22, from verse 1 to 3, it said even the trees that will grow on the streets of that new Jerusalem, it said it will be for the healing of the nations. So there will be the new Jerusalem and there will be the new nations in the new earth. Those who will make it into the new Jerusalem, those are those who will be enthroned, who will be crowned. Those are the ones that God will appoint some to become rulers over nations. So when we get to heaven, some will rule others. Don't think that government ends on earth. Unfortunately, all our governors and senators that are politicians, they will not know the politics of eternity. Because the politics of eternity is not manipulation. It's trials. It's love for God. It's tribulation. It's travail. It's witness. And you see, that type of politics is not about talking. It's about dying for Christ. And so, many who will make it there, those who are servants here, they will become rulers there. And let me show you how they judge there. As I round up. Revelation 2.26 And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Next verse. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So, <laughs> many people will be saved because of the works of Jesus. And they refuse process on earth. When they go there, that's when the teachers of eternity will rise up. Because what you were not taught on earth, you will be taught in heaven. <laughs> I don't have time to explain this one. I will need to open a lot of scripture. But let me tell you, eh? I'm not talking about Paul Gatry. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Zion. Because you must fulfill your ordination. So those who run from process in time, when they enter these nations, when the governors come, what they use the rod of iron to do is to carry them through a process that will bring them into who they are supposed to be in God. Because the process will continue. The challenge now is that that realm does not have time. So what you should have learned in two years, you may learn for aeons with the rod of iron. That's why they are governors. Because he doesn't give the rod to the governor in vain. Those rods are for a purpose. To ensure order. To ensure training. To ensure transformation. Because people will still need some level of transfiguration. So that you will meet up the, the, the bandwidth of glory. What is the basis for being entrusted with nations? Luke 19, 12 to 26. You read about the king that gave talents to his servants. To one he gave ten, he made ten more. Another he gave five, he made five more. Another he gave one, he hid it. When the master showed up, the one that had ten said, I have made ten more. He said, good, faithful servant. Because you have done this, I will give you authority over ten cities. The one that won five and added five more, he said, I will give you authority over five cities. The one that had won and refused, that one even accused God. 
So now we are not talking about condemnation. People have been saved though. But there are still those who are accusing God. I didn't use the talent you gave me because you are a hard man. So I hid it. And the master said, you are a wicked man. If you don't do anything with it, why didn't you put it in the bank? At least there would have been interest. He now said, take it from him. That's the rod of iron. And give it to the one that has ten. And everybody shouted, but this person already has ten. He said, yes. Him that has and wants to have more. He said, him that does not have and does not desire to have. Even the little he has will be taken from him. And give it to him that has and wishes to have more. This is why you must always desire. So the basis for ruling nations is the degree to which you tread with what God gave you now. Some of you, God gave you talents. Some of you, God gave you anointings. Some of you, God gave you wisdom. Some of you, God gave you access. What are you doing with it? Everything God gives you that you waste will disqualify you from authority and rulership in the world to come. God does not tolerate waste. Faithfulness is the key here. He said, if you are faithful in little, you will be faithful in much. When Jesus multiplied bread, he said, gather every fragment, not loaf, fragment. Let nothing be wasted. So, what you do with what God gave you now is the basis for what God will give you in the world that is to come. God gave you grace for politics and governance. You tried a campaign as a counselor. You failed. That was all. You say, I won't do again. You are in trouble. God gave you grace for business. You started a kiosk. And for 30 years, you still have a kiosk. You have not gone to a level of supermarket. You have not gone to begin to dominate the market. God gave you grace for access. Every governor you meet, every senator you meet, every politician, uh, president you meet, meet, you have not done anything. All you have as your credential are pictures. You have snapped with three presidents and it doesn't translate to anything. You are misbehaving with what you were given. God gave you a ministry. You are in one location for 40 years. If that's all God says you do, do it. But if it doesn't multiply, it means you cannot handle great things. And so nations will not be committed to you. Those who will be entrusted with nations are those who pass the test of faithfulness. Can you bow your heads? What I shared, some of you, you are hearing it for the first time. So it's giving you headache. You can't articulate it. You can't. It's, it's much. So you followed for 10 minutes. In the last 52 minutes, you have not been following because your head is aching. You have, you have not been brought to this corridor before. So when you go back, go and listen to the message again. After the sixth time, it will start making sense to you. What I did tonight is to deposit it in your spirit as a witness. Your mind tried to hurt with it. Elohim Adonai.
me. I want to be relevant in eternity. See, no matter how long you live in time, it's too short. Time is like a dot in eternity. No matter how old you are here. In fact, the moment you turn 70, 80, you start losing test and appetite for the things of this life. I was telling my wife the other day, I don't like food again. And I'm wondering, they bring goat meat. It's just somehow to me. They bring beef. I'm want, how many of you are experiencing it? You don't even know what you want to eat. They bring swallow, they bring rice. Food is just food. And you are wondering, what? I see, sometimes you just eat for strength. And see how young we are. I'm wondering, what will now happen when we are 80? We would have become tired of this world. No matter how old you live, time is a dot in eternity. It's a dot. This is why you must pay attention to the things that give you relevance in the world to come. Can you lift your hands and say, Lord, help me. Help me. This is one area where all of us need help. Lord, help me. I'm going to pray just one prayer and we're out of here. Because tonight is a night of sober meditation. Sober reflection. Go and think about your life. Find out what is your weight in Zion. I know you are popular among men. I know you have position in churches and organizations. But what is your weight? What is your weight? Where it really matters. Daniel saw a vision. He said, you have been weighed in the balances. If you are weighed, what is your weight? That's the question from this service. What's your weight? Because if you are growing in these things, you will see a measure of it in time. This is why some people talk and they affect nations. Some people talk, they affect people's lives. Some people talk, they change circumstances. It's because what they are in the spirit, a measure of it is already manifesting in time. What is your weight in the spirit? Can you ask the Lord to help you? Hey, ha. right hand. Only your right hand. I want to pray one prayer. That God will baptize somebody with the spirit of martyrdom. When you leave this service, go and download a book. It's free online. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs. And read it. It will change your Christianity. Fox's. F-O-X-E-S. Fox's book of Matthias. Download it. You will see the chronicles of overcomers. It will change your Christianity. You will discover most of what we are doing is infants we are raising. Christians who wear pampas in the spirit. I want to pray for the grace. Self-denial. Martyrdom. The ability to endure death. Trials. Tribulation for the kingdom. That's where you will know your capacity. When the devil fights you and you refuse to break, you stand your ground. Everybody thought you will break. The more they fight you, the stronger you become. The brighter the glory. Because there's something in you that reinforces you from Zion. Can we be, can we be quiet now? Just play only the keyboard for me. Jesus is looking for warriors Warriors, warriors We have too many church members Our number is even becoming a challenge 
That's why we are fighting for food and position. Every time there's multitude, the battle is food. But Jesus is looking for warriors. The men of the inner court and the holy of holies. The holiest of all. The people we can entrust with the weight, the burden, and the mandate of the kingdom. And this credential is not Bible school certificate. They are signatures, intimacy, self-denial, death, trials, tribulation. Those are the signatures. But there's a grace that sponsors it. Father, ordain from among us witnesses of the world to come. Witnesses. Ushers, help me. Witnesses. Witnesses. Men like John that can cry and a city will go down in righteousness because they carry the badge of love. They carry the testimony of endurance. They carry witness of intimacy. Men like Enoch, the Enochian generation, men that walk with God, even in the secret place, he said, and Moses stepped into the deep darkness where God was. Men that can find God when the voice of God is not common. We are the Christians that serve God without gain. People who carry the burdens of the Father, the weight of nations, the cries. He said, Jonah, go to Nineveh. A nation needs to repent. Those are the burdens of Abba. And the man was on his way to Tarshish. We don't want people who have scorned mission and go to where they can find gain. If a whale needs to swallow you, and bring you back to Nineveh. May that encounter happen to you. And when Jonah stepped into that border, the Bible says he cried. The king tore his garment. The whole nation repented. Even animals fasted. See the weight of calling that this guy had. But all he was taught was self preservation. Until a whale had to carry him through a school. We are the martyrs. We are the carriers of the signatures of the world to come. We are those who can continue in his tribulation, in his trials. Father, anoint from among us wise men who judge things from parameters of Zion. Not the things that men clamor after. Not the things that men celebrate. But the things that angels try to peep into because of their sacredness. What has me now? I sense the Lord lay his hands on some people now. It's the weight of glory. Add some volume for me now. Ah, ah, hey. Bring them here. Hey, hey, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, hey, hey, hey. you angels of fire will touch you now. Angels. Because they are the witnesses of the courts of heaven. He said in the year that King Josiah died I saw visions of God. And he saw even the seraphims. Because you are going to be inducted into a school of process. Where they will teach you the ways of the spirit. Where they will teach you the burdens of Abba. Where they will teach you how to ascend the mountains of God. Where judgment is passed. Where legislations are given. Where oracles are committed. Keepers of gates in the spirit.
Thank you, Father. Now hear me. If you are here tonight and you have been doing church or maybe you have not even been coming to church because you are tired with the church thing. And some you have been coming but to you is just church. But you don't know about eternities. About the commitments. About the submissions. About the surrenders. This is your opportunity. To come into genuine intimacy with God and to surrender so that grace can make you. If you are here and you want to surrender completely to the master and say from today I live for you only and I must be relevant in the world to come. Lift your right hand toward heaven. I want to lead you to Jesus so that you have an experience with him. Leave those under the anointing and allow God to talk to, to, to touch them. This is just a, a sign. Some of you, is as you go home, you will lose your peace. You will go on 40 days past. Some 120. Something will hit you. The words you heard now, they will start echoing in your heart. Some of you for many months. Those of you lifting your hands, lift it properly. You want to surrender completely to Jesus. No more games. There are thrones. There are crowns. There are glories. There are powers awaiting. And you want to partake of it. If you have lifted your hand, carry your bag, carry your phone, whatever you brought to church with, come to the front. Now there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let them stand at their back. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. When we walk with the Lord in the light. Please hear me. It's good that you are making this commitment. Congratulations. But after you are done, you need to be taught certain truths. That's why we have what we call the School of Spiritual Foundation, so that we teach you. There are certain emphases that are cardinal, but they are no longer being taught. This is 21st century church. We are under pressure to raise money, to be relevant. So we are no longer doing things that affect the souls of men. But God wants to raise a new generation. And that's why he's emphasizing these things. Place your hand on your chest. It's a simple thing to surrender to God. And then the grace of God will help you to stay surrendered. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is your son. He died for my sins. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. For my justification. Today, I publicly confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord, my Master, my Owner, and my Savior. I surrender to His will. I surrender to His Word. I surrender to His Spirit. I live for Him only. And so I receive His life into my spirit today. Thank you, Father, for accepting me. In Jesus' precious name I have declared. The Lord keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance over you. And give you peace. You will not fall by the wayside. Now follow our, our um, counselors through this aisle. Just go to the back. They will get some of your details. 
and baptize some of you in the Holy Ghost and teach you how to be unruly. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that He died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God. Kindly send us an email, prayer at encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministriesinternational.org. God bless you.